to talk about. He's the cultural specialist, but I think you're about to become a director. They say a coordinator. A coordinator. Yeah. Okay. It, same thing that I've always well, done. You can visit him at the <laughs> Spider Gallery, and he's got a vast knowledge. He talks a lot about Cherokee symbolism. Um, he does a great presentation on that as well. Um, just a few reminders if you do need to use the restroom, it's um, to my left over here. There's a, a restroom back there. Also, we are live streaming this, so please put any phones on uh, vibrate or turn them off. So I guess we'll go ahead and make it started. Mississippi and the Missouri Rivers converge, 
there was an even more closely linked network. Small communities, some consisting of just a few houses planted at the edge of a cornfield, were linked to larger villages, which were themselves linked to still larger communities, some with thousands of residents. At the center of them all was Cahokia. Cahokia, the great mounds, the vast ceremonial plazas, houses as far as the eye could see. Cahokia, it was the seat of power, of vitality, of wealth, of security. It prevailed for several hundred years. Cahokia, its many parts were sighted with great and deliberate precision. Each area had a function. There were enormous plazas for games, ceremonies, and great gatherings. There were miles of stockade wall protecting the central ceremonial area. There was a unique sun calendar that we call Woodhenge. There were fields of corn and other crops vast enough to feed up to 20,000 inhabitants and produce a surplus. There were immense pits, and from these, earth for the mounds was dug. There were ridge-top mounds marking the city's boundaries. There were flat-top mounds where buildings stood, and there were conical <coughs> burial mounds. And there was one mound greater than all the others, greater than any other structure in the whole Mississippian world. This great platform of earth was at the center of the community. It was the highest point and the home of the chief. For a year, he ruled the earth and spoke to the sky. His wealth was immeasurable, his wisdom profound, his authority unquestionable. The chief was responsible for maintaining balance between the spiritual forces of the upper world and the lower world. And perhaps even more challenging, he was responsible for maintaining order and harmony among the people. Service rendered to him was as to the gods. With his wisest advisors, the chief directed construction of the great mound, the site of his temple. For the thousands of laborers, building the mound was an act of loyalty and of faith. Building it in stages, they dug the earth with stone hoes and carried it on their backs in woven baskets, 50 to 60 pounds at a time, 15 million times over a 300-year period. They watched the great mound as it grew, and they were proud. and other structures. They struggled with all the byproducts of urban life, such as crowding, garbage, crime. They raised children, nursed their sick, and buried their dead. As Cahokia grew in population, it also grew in complexity. A single family group, which in an earlier time would have been able to provide for all its own needs, now had to trade and work with other clans and families to survive. Much as in our own society, relationships extended beyond the family to weave a web of interdependence within the community. For the people of Cahokia, each day was a challenge to the body, to the mind, and to the spirit.
human beings everywhere and in every era, Mississippian people used their myths and beliefs to help them understand their world, its seen and unseen aspects, its known and unknown nature. We find clues to their beliefs in the rituals they performed and in the symbols they used. A seed is buried like a friend who has passed away and from it grows a new plant which ripens and is harvested so that the seed may be planted again. Death follows life and life follows death. It is a cycle never ending. Or consider the snake that lives under the earth and can be seen to emerge from its old dead skin wearing a fresh new one. the sun, the giver of fire and life, advancing across the heavens in a perfect, predictable arc. Use it to chart the seasons. Use it to mark the moment when day and night are equal. Use it to measure the cycles of life. We look back at Cahokia with boundless curiosity. Every day, new scientific techniques, new technologies, and new ideas help us to understand the culture that ruled this valley for hundreds of years. But there are still many mysteries to unravel and many discoveries to be made. For example, no one knows exactly why Cahokia began to decline sometime late in the 13th or early in the 14th century. We know the end came slowly over many years as Cahokia's authority and power were challenged. We know poor nutrition and disease were growing problems. Maybe changes in climate, dwindling resources, and a growing population or perhaps class conflict, <coughs> conflicts within the group or from the outside also contributed to the decline. These mysteries endure and they challenge us to think harder, to reach back with the power of imagination to a time long ago when embers fed by the sacred fire glowed and smoldered through the night. In those days, the earth was bountiful, and my people were many, and many fires warmed us. We planted maize and prayed for blessings from the rain and the sun. We traveled far and returned with many fine things. We saw fine houses and great temples. But wherever we walked, we sang proud songs about the greatness of our home because none we saw throughout the land could match the splendor and the majesty of this place. This place, where the maze grows tallest, where the runners are most swift, where the builders reach the sky, and where the noble sun shines most brightly. I want to take it in class oh, in a brand new way. I want that spray <laughs> um,
<laughs> Anyone ever heard the saying, if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy? Uh -huh. And if grandma's not happy, run. <laughs> I think many of our native people mm -hmm. will probably understand why the uh, the mound, the Mississippian culture is no longer in existence. If you look at art, about 1200, um, the corn mother figurines, um, they stopped making those quite so often and many of them were shattered and broken as if intentionally done and you'll see more of the eagle man uh, start to show up about that time so there are some who believe that the um, female uh, dominated leadership changed um, our, our women used to uh, determine who um, land was given to uh, inheritance things like that so um, about about 1200 um, there are people who have uh, who believe that that is what began to make the change in the Mississippian uh, time period now when we talk about Mississippian um, I want to make sure that we're not um, just thinking about uh, the river itself but the river is very important um, it was a, a time period when all the tribes um, got to get together um, and most of these mounts, Cahokia in, in particular, was probably, uh, some compare it to a holy site. Um, it could have been like Jerusalem, uh, a place where people made a pilgrimage um, to, to come to this place. Um, it was not one tribe but many tribes uh, that populated these areas. And the reason why we have so many of our art uh, that is similar to those patterns that we find there, I believe it's because we traded with them, but it also um, matches with our migration story, Cherokee migration story. Um, there are three components that I like to uh, emphasize. The gourd. Did we have any corn? Ah, uh, that's not a chip. Someone had tortillas. and uh, Right here. Here we go. Here we go. Traditional Cherokee food right here. It's got corn in it. Um, and the other thing is our language. Um, so they say that we lived on an island and we were surrounded by the sea and turtles uh, uh, came to this island. They say that we had everything that we needed there. Uh, there was no sickness because there was a plant for every illness that there was. Um, the earth began to shake, fire was everywhere, and the water began to rise. And they said we had to leave. Um, when we left, um, they say there were many clans some say 14, some say 40. I've, I've heard, depending on how many elders you speak to, uh, I've heard different stories. Um, but most of them come back to this, that seven canoes arrived on the mainland. And that is why there are seven clans today uh, in our, our Cherokee people. Now, they were happy for a little while, but then someone got sick and we realized we didn't bring that plant with us, and so we had to look for it. Uh, and they say that our search for those medicine plants took us to many places. They say we passed the people who rolled steps from, uh, rolled heads from steps in the clouds, and we passed the people who built mounds up to the sun. They say we also went so far north that corn wouldn't grow. So that brings me to the gourd corn and language. Um, the gourd tells us that the gourd samples that were found here in North America that date back to six to 10,000 BC, that those pre-Columbian gourds were from Asia down through climates where gourds cannot grow and they pass through several zones where gourds cannot grow and then somehow they started growing. 
They still teach that in school today, by the way. And none of those samples were found anywhere in the north. Has anyone grown gourds? Any gourd growers in here? There's one. What happens when it gets cold? They die. They just, just shrivel it's up just and gone. die. Yes. They, they love warm climates. Now, Cherokee legend tells us that the gourd is a gift from the creator that came floating on the water. In 2005, the University of Pennsylvania done some DNA testing on those pre-Columbian gourd samples, and they found that they are African and not Asian. So, based upon uh, that discovery, they decided to test the currents of the ocean, and they found that gourds would arrive on Brazil's coast within about nine months. If you threw them from Africa, it took them about nine months to get to Brazil. So, there's one marker. Any legend, um, at some point, someone had to see it. Someone had to tell the story in order for it to be repeated. So someone, somewhere, seen gourds floating on the water. The other marker is corn. Corn is a staple part of almost all Native American diets. And we have our own word for it. It's not anything like the Mexican's word, the Spanish word for it. Um, many tribes have their own word for corn. Um, so in almost all of those cultures, uh, it is believed that corn has always been a part of who we are. Corn has been carbon dated as originating mid-Mexico and spreads north and south from there. That's their second marker. The third and final marker is our language. The Cherokee language, uh, we have one other um, family and they are originally from this area. Anybody remember what the other Cherokee language is only shared with? Iroquois. Um, so they say we went so far north that it was too cold for corn to grow. Now, linguistic anthropologists, they say that the split between the Iroquois and the Cherokee language had to have been five to a thousand, five hundred to a thousand uh, years ago. Uh, the differences between those two languages, they say that it's been that long that that split took place. So, they say that we went so far north that corn wouldn't grow and we came back to a place that was more familiar to us. Um, corn grows well in um, the fertile um, river bottoms around the Smoky Mountain areas. Um, and so we settled in this area. And, and, and I'm, I'm being um, a little reserved here because when the English came and they wanted land, we gave them land. So our borders may have been larger than that, but we do have documentation um, that that was our, our borders. Um, but if we look at our migration uh, path, we pass through all of these areas where all of these mounds are located, and there are mounds located in our um, traditional homeland. The one thing that I've noticed in those archaeological finds is that in all of these other mound sites, the serpent, the rattlesnake, is not there. It's only found in our part of the country. So I believe, and I don't think I'm the only one that believes it, but I think that uh, that serpent, the rattlesnake, is definitely Cherokee. Um, there are many things that uh, we all can claim jointly because there's no definitive proof uh, that says this was Choctaw, this was Creek. Um, although we were neighbors, and remember that the, um, the, the greatest mound um, that there was was the place that all the different tribes came to as their um, temple, if you will. Another reason why I believe that that culture is no longer here, 
Um, I don't think this video covered it, but um, these mounds are also burial sites. Um, and you'll find that in some of them, remember I, talk, I spoke about the, the, the eagle, the bird, the bird man? Um, there was a grave unearthed. Uh, the man was probably in his 40s, and he had a shell bead um, shawl, and it had uh, the falcon on it. Now, near his grave, um, a grave where there were four headless, handless, uh, a grave beside him that had over 50 men and women whose skulls uh, shown that they were bashed in and then another grave that had 50 young women who looked like they willingly uh, were sacrificed. That's another reason why I think someone who has that much power um, and takes that many people to the grave with them, surely they can't live very long, right? Um, somebody's going to want to get rid of get rid of that way uh, of doing things. But um, What were some other key points to remember about the mound culture? Um, we talked about um, when women's roles as a whole began to change because we in this room know that the women's role didn't change in the Cherokees, right? Mom's still boss. Um, and, and grandma. Grandma's really the ultimate boss, but uh, yeah. So, so some, things, some things have never changed, but uh, for the majority of, of the people um, that built the mounds, uh, perhaps that is the reason why uh, they are no longer uh, with us today. They are still with us today. There, there are parts of those cultures uh, that are still revered today. I think the Choctaw, for instance, still, um, many, many of the Southeast uh, tribes uh, still recognize um, the ceremonies that, that our, our ancient uh, mound building culture, uh, the Mississippian people, I'll get the word out here in a minute, um, recognized. I see that we have some very learned uh, individuals in the audience. And I know that there's a sign-in sheet going around, and I've probably waited too long to say this. If you're an artist, if you're an educator, um, something brief, something, you know, kind of give us an idea um, what, uh, what, we, what we're working with here. And uh, I am at the point where I think we'll take some questions if, uh, if we're we're at that point. How are we doing on time, too? We're good. We're good? I'm sure um, someone asked that you repeat it because I'm in the live stream. No, oh, yeah. Good. Remind me. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me that we're... So is there, um, is there any theory, or do you have a theory, you know, you talk about the, the, uh, the islands surrounded by water and the turtles and then the rumbling of the earth and the people had to move. Um, based on the information, you know, the boards and the, and the information kind of that tells the markers that you were mentioning. Do you have any sort of theory about where that location might have been um, to the extent there's a real location? The question makes sense. The, okay, so the, the question in the audience was, are, based upon our migration story, do we have an idea where that island uh, may have been? I have not heard anyone make a um, definitive pinpoint location. Um, and I think that's probably because um, it is similar to the story found in the Bible of being driven from the Garden of Eden with the flaming sword. And um, it's, it's not one of those things that if we know where it's at, that we share where it's at. Um, does that make sense? No, I think it's interesting that the Eastern Man doesn't mention or acknowledge. I went to their cultural institute that they did, mm -hmm. and they don't even acknowledge. Have, the, we have a mic. Oh, we do. We do don't we? They don't even acknowledge the the migration story. Well, 
And, and depending upon which elder you talk to, uh, some of our elders here say that the Smoky Mountains is where we came from and, and that uh, we just, I guess we fell from the sky. And there are, there are, I shouldn't have made a joke like that because some people believe, yes, that we fell from the sky. Um, there are some people that I've met who I think they are aliens. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, you're not from here. <laughs> oh, we have some in the room, huh? <laughs> I have a question. Yes, Linda. We see a lot of designs that are similar to the Mayan design. Yes. Remember that our migration story um, brought us through their part of the country. Okay. And, and another key point um, that, that Linda has brought up is we have interstates, we have the internet, we, we are connected like this, you know, in a hurry. Our people back then were still connected. And the reason why these sites are where they're at is because that was the mode of transportation. They were near a waterway that went uh, from <coughs> Cahokia to the Gulf. Um, and there's uh, archaeological evidence found at those sites. Ivory um, from the northwest is found there. Shells from the northeast are found there. And sh um, marine shells uh, from Mexico are found there. Really yes. Have parrot, feathers also. Parrot, feathers. parrot feathers, yes. And as some of our artists that do, uh, that yeah. make bows, they talk about obsidian that's from Oregon and Washington area that's found in the southeast. Mm -hmm. So the trade routes were very extensive. Absolutely. And not only were they restricted to this continent, because unlike the Spanish church in the 1400s, there were people living during this time that knew that the world was not flat. Because we had people from faraway places who there's evidence here that they were here uh, long before that. Yes, sir. You mentioned the, uh, the elevation and the respect that, that women had in the, uh, in the government and everything like that. So was it seems that the the women were in control and they selected uh, someone to be their spokesperson um, which probably was their son or a nephew or something like that but then again this could be one of those things where this is where um, that era had started to change because these these uh, mound building cultures seem to have one leader and that leader was almost treated like a god. Um, and perhaps um, as long as the crops were growing good, uh, as long as there was animals, uh, there was game for them to eat, um, they would keep doing those human sacrifices uh, because that's, what, that's why they were healthy, that's why they were wealthy, that's why they were well. But when things started to change, um, people began to question uh, whether or not. It was kind of like, almost by committee that leader was maybe in place. I believe, I believe so. It looks, it looks like the elder women, uh, just like our Cherokee culture, um, and, and I believe that we all shared those same core values uh, and systems of government. Um, and it makes sense that we all, when we all went to these places, because there are... Um, <laughs> patterns that uh, Linda brought up that's found in pottery that's also on our pottery and then some designs um, for instance um, the Mayan art uh, we find shell carving that's that's located in Cherokee country which almost looks identical identical to some that was found uh, in the, the Aztec and Mayan uh, part of Mexico yes ma'am it's about the trade route you mentioned, uh, and, and a lot of books mention that there was a trade language. Has any of that survived so that they could read really different tribes could speak to each other and understand each other? That probably goes back to the designs. Um, some of the, um, there's some discussion about, and of course, um, some of the designs that are found on pottery 
are probably trade lanes. That's on that pot says this is a water pot. Um, and you can, I, I, I've, I didn't bring it with me, uh, but if you look at some of those designs, there are water patterns, um, and then inverted another way could be a wind pattern. Um, but I think some of those um, pottery pieces were those ancient languages. Yes, ma'am. So how many women did you say they sacrificed? Uh, in that one burial site, there were 50 young women. Um, but in adjacent to that one was over 50 of mixed se uh, different sexes. So maybe there was just running out of women. Maybe so. <laughs> maybe so. <laughs> that could. That, yeah. I, mean, that yeah. would make your, I would think your tribe, since now you have no women bearers. Uh, <laughs> too many people talking. <laughs> what is it? Mez, at the Chickasaws or the. Nachi Natchez that they have a story about one of their leaders like they would come through the streets and they would literally sacrifice their their children like there's an account of it early early on um, but when you look I mean it's all this bout that had the 50 young women when they exhumed those uh, remains um, uh, evidence of willingly um, participated where it looked like it was, well, they said that some of them bashed in uh, because their fingers were dug into uh, the earth. Um, so some of them may have not been willing, but um, if you are convinced that this man is God, and if you don't please him, um, Bad things are going to happen not only to you, but to your family, to your children, and your name will never uh, be heard again on the earth, you know. Um, there are many ways that these things hopefully could never happen again, but... Um, well, I imagine they probably had them doped up or something, you know, because, you know, if I've seen them doped you know, like this in my mind. The woman's just not going to jump off. They probably go like this and throw her off. Well, I mean, if you're like, <laughs> if you're raised this way from yeah. a child, well, and still, it's yeah. it's brainwashed, you're if in you it. will. You're going to yeah. do it. Huh? Yeah. I don't know. Not everyone. I mean, look at look at Jim Jones, <laughs> right? And the Kool Aid. So, yeah. yeah. I guess that's yeah. more a question, Matt. Yes, Linda. Uh, now you're talking about chief. At, at that time, they had priests also. Well, may have read it was a god, if you will. So it was probably a religious uh, leader. He commanded that much respect. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, on on from our side, what I will say about Cherokee people, um, some of our elders have said that we had a priest clan, if you will, and it probably dates back to this time when there was human sacrifices. And uh, as you can imagine, if more of your family are required to be sacrificed, after a while, it's going to get, we're going to get upset. We're going like, to... Rebellion. Yeah. And, and, and what that may teach us today, too, is that if you think you're better than me, think again. <laughs> because... That clan no longer exists. For some reason, they begin to die. <laughs> you can imagine why, right? Any other questions? Are we still doing good on time? Now, I've got some things here that uh, if you'd like to look at. Some of these things predate uh, Columbus, not the artifact, the technique, the way we make things. Um, predate uh, Columbus. Um, one of the artifacts that you'll find at one of the mounds was the uh, female figure who has a um, twined wrap skirt. She has the serpent that's around her and she has the hoe and she is planting corn. Um, she is wearing pucker toe moccasins. 
Yeah, so uh, a lot of those things are, are very ancient. Uh, finger weaving is something that predates Columbus. Uh, when DeSoto documented the textiles that our people were doing, finger weaving and twining was two of the things that, uh, that were documented. And if you get a chance, we have a great museum here. It's called the Cherokee National Historical Society. <laughs> but there's also another museum that's not too far away. Um, it is in Bentonville, Arkansas, and it's called the Museum of Native American History. And right now they have a very wonderful collection of ancient pottery, um, flint um, uh tools, um, textiles, war bonnets. There's, there's many different tribes represented there, but there is uh, a Mississippian period there's several pieces there, but this particular piece is there. So I was sitting this far away from the original artifact, and I was able to recreate this out of clay that I dug over near Holbert, and I created it while I was sitting there looking at that original piece, and so now I am, and, and that piece still shines like it has a glaze on it and it was burnished with the rock, just like I'm doing this piece. So if you can see, even in the light that we have here, you can see the light refracted on there. The bottom part, I have not burnished yet. Do you see how matte that is now? So with a stone, a smooth stone, you are able to slip the surface and what it does is it makes those pores a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller until it becomes a, a glassy uh, finish. When I fire this, that finish will be there 500 years from now. So I encourage those of you that are interested in art to learn our ancient techniques and keep them alive because 800 years from now, someone's gonna unearth the pot that Linda Taylor made. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, what is in the exhibit that's uh, over this weekend at Gilcrease? Um, that one was called. It's been there a little while. Oh. It's something about before the removal. Yes, 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 yes. After the removal. Oh, after the removal. What's it called, Renetta? After removal. After, after removal. removal. Yes. Correct. Is it? Cherokee. Um, I think it's got a little bit of everything. Yeah. I've got some shell, a shell carving piece here, and um, some clay pieces. Um, we go out to um, our communities. Um, it's hard to do shell carving, especially. All right. So this is something that we could have done in a in a setting like this. Whereas if we actually carved the real shell, um, I would need everyone to wear masks. We'd have to have water to keep the dust from flying around. We'd have to have some sharp tools. Ain't that right, Miss Shell Carver back there? Yes. But with this piece of clay, uh, this clay is fashioned like the shape of a shell. And we can create those designs, those Mississippian uh, mound building culture time uh, designs on there with a sharpie. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Anybody can handle a sharpie, right? So we, we do the traditional arts. We teach that at the art center, but we also make it where anybody uh, can do it on, on a short time um, frame too. But any other questions about the presentation that we have presented today? Well, I find it. Yes, ma'am. Be natural colors there. I'm just looking how bright they are. The basket. Yeah. The basket is uh, done with commercial reed. But uh, the reason why I brought this basket is, and and perhaps I I should uh, say that the things that we have learned, <clears throat> the things that we have heard, the things that we have been taught by other people from outsiders, if you will, um, aren't always true. They said that we wove baskets so tightly that they could hold water. This is, this is a basket that's made the old way. This is made with the outside skin of river cane, 
and there are two walls on every side of this basket. There are two walls here. But this is how it began. Now they said that we wove it so tight that it would hold water. Maybe it was really tight, but what they didn't know was that at this stage right here, we could take pine tar and ash and we could coat this and then build the outer wall over it. So don't tell them. <laughs> But yes, those, those are uh, dyed with commercial reed. Um, the, uh, every color on there, though, we could, find, we could find a plant that could create that color, though. Uh, what plant would do the turquoise? Turquoise. Indigo is a plant. Um, I know the blood root. A blood root can get orange and, and red, depending on when you gather it. Um, walnut, you can get um, anywhere from a gray to a brown to a uh, black. Um, and it also depends on what part of the plant you use, too. Have y'all learned anything? Yeah. You feel wiser? Another question. See yes. that pop that's got the design on it? Yeah, both of those. These what? are these are ancient designs that I have tried to uh, bring into the modern day. So these are, are pots similar to ceremonial cups that were found in, in archaeological digs of just firing them in the in the fire. You drunk out of there? You can well, it probably would, but it's just for ceremony, right? Yes, ceremony. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't want to go Try, work day. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I got injured drinking coffee. It wasn't hot, it was sharp. <laughs> well, do we have any more questions? If not, um, I know some folks are going to want to come up and, and look at all this. I will say next month, I think it's February 15th, is the third Thursday. I have Omar Reed from Fort Gibson Historic Site coming over to talk about the first Kansas um, volunteer infantry. So um, Civil War, Civil War buffs, but it's also not that we should only all just get our own month, but um, it's African American Heritage Month, and so I wanted to make sure that we highlighted um, African Americans during uh, the Civil War in Cherokee Nation and Indian Territory. So that's why we've got Omar coming over and he does an excellent talk on all of that. So hopefully you guys will join us for that next month. Um, and I guess we'll go ahead and, and dismiss. Thank you.